Hello everyone. All right, uh, can you hear me? One, two, three. Oh, yeah, perfect. All right. Just wanted to see if my microphone works because I had uh, connectivity problems and uh, finally I got connected. I just want to make sure that it actually goes through. All right, uh, so uh, let's uh, start without any hesitation. And today we are going to talk about. Uh, um, Composition aggregation associations, and uh, uh, we are going to go through to understand what they are. Then we're going to hit the functions, understand what ex expression and functions are, and uh, go through it and uh, uh, kind of um, uh, understand how functions are uh, uh, not we what we always think of, and we can actually treat them as uh, simple data that's sitting somewhere that we can access for a certain purpose. Uh, we, um, I see many people are still joining, so um, I'm just going to pause the recording and wait for like two, three minutes for everyone to join, and then we're going to continue, we're going to start. So I'm going to pause the recording, uh, and you see my screen, right? I'm going to start my poll too, by the way, because that's like that I get a quick answer. Perfect. So that's that. So the poll works too. And I created that. Uh, so the one that you see, it says uh, chat view. That's I opened up the chat view in case somebody wants to actually type a chat ma message so I can see. And uh, here I am. So uh, um, let's start. So we want to understand. And um, uh, one thing I have to mention before we uh, continue. Uh, we are, there we go, four minutes into, yeah, the makeup session that I wanted to put on uh, to kind of catch up with what we have, with what we had, uh, we couldn't do it last Friday, so I set it up to be this Friday, and uh, I'm going to do it around uh, seven o'clock in the afternoon, I'll post the exact hour, so on Friday, we're going to uh, do the makeup session, and uh, whatever the time is, whatever the lecture is at that point, I'm going to carry that lecture over there so we can actually catch up with it. So that's that. Now, um, let's talk about composition aggregation associations. 
understand what they are. These are essentially relationship between objects that we are uh, we want to talk about over here. And I um, gave you a couple of examples. I brought a couple of examples over here to show you. Um, uh, wrote up a couple of examples that I'm going to show you. Um, but um, the examples that for, for understanding the note is giving us is pretty good. So um, uh, it says composition. So composition essentially is when you um, have relationship between two classes and the relationship that you have is uh, ownership between one class and another. That's what we uh, call uh, composition. Let me turn on the light over here to see if it makes any difference. All right. Yeah, I think it's, it's better like this. All right. So when you have composition, the, the object that in question where you say if it's a composed uh, object or not, it, it is actually built up of uh, pieces that is the second object that it has relation, relationship to. And this composition um, essentially makes one thing uh, uh, meaningless without another thing. Just assume a relationship between an array and its elements. If I do not have an element, I do not have an array. And therefore, an array without an element doesn't make sense. So if I wanted to create a couple of classes to actually uh, define what is uh, an element and uh, what is an array, uh, I cannot, first of all, even think of an array without an element. If you remove the existence of an element from an array, Array doesn't make sense. It doesn't. Ex it doesn't have anything. It's. It, 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 it doesn't exist. That's composition. The good example that uh, we have in the notes is person and its name. So if you don't have a person, you don't have a name. If you if a person doesn't have a name, it just uh, it doesn't make sense. So that's the example that uh, the uh, the class the the note is giving. The example that I have for you is a stack. So let me just bring this up. I'm going to just, uh, I wrote this code for a, for a stack to, to show you exactly. That's OP244. We don't want to go back there. 345. So, wow, it's 2019. That's okay. Anyways, uh, uh, t take a look at the uh, the template that I created over here uh, of a stack. First of all, I have to explain to you what a stack is. Let me get my pen over here. we need to have a pen. All right, so uh, how many of you actually know what is a stack? So Okay, so majority of us don't know what a stack is. So let me tell you what a stack is, and then we'll, we'll continue after that. So uh, a stack is essentially uh, Melissa. Yes. Oh, uh, sure. I'm recording locally. Let me put that one over there. Anyways, that's the quality of that. This one is much better than the other one. But thank you very much. We'll start recording on that one too. Thank you for letting me know. All right. So, um, a stack. What is a stack? A stack is 
or literally the English word of it. Like when you are in a kitchen, you have a stack of plates. When you say a stack of plates, what does it mean? It means y you have series of plates stacked on each other, and it goes like that. Now, um, let's say you are only two people living in an apartment or in a house, and in your kitchen you have a stack of 12 plates. So when you want to eat, you pick up the the two top ones and you eat in them if you're lazy you don't want to wash it you put it in a, I don't know put it aside and the next meal you pick up another two and another two a day is passed then you wash everything you put the six back on if that's the case you understand that most of the time that last plate down there the 12th one is never going to be touched because you pick the top ones and uh Usually the top ones are used. Why? Because the last thing that you put at the top of the plate is the first thing you are picking up. Stacks are like that. When you are dealing with stacks, you have series of... <clears throat> so you have series of things sitting uh, on top of each other. So if, I, if this is one element of stack, the next element goes on top. If that happens, you want to pick it up, you have to pick up the top one, and then uh, the top one is the first one that you are picking first. So the thing that goes in last is picked up first. The stack sounds like a very unusual type of thing. It's like an array that uh, you can never have access to any element but the one that is sitting at the top, and there is, it is impossible to get to the second one. Um, that's the perfect example for it. And they call it uh, LIFO2, last in, first out. So the last thing that is put in is the first one that is going to come out. Do we understand what stack is with respect of uh, order? All right. Now, if I want to implement something like this in C language or C++, how can you implement such a thing? To do something like this, they create something. Um, this table is pretty awkward. So, so what happens is something like this. When you uh, uh, deal with, uh, uh, with a, a stack, uh, we have two entities. We have the stack and we have the stack elements. Stack elements are called nodes. They call it nodes. So essentially, a stack is an entity that has a pointer in it, and that pointer is supposed to point to a node. Now, the trick with this one is that that node, and they call this, uh, they call this one, they call this one, this pointer, they call this pointer top. Because that's the top, that always points to the top of the list. And as the time goes by and you add more uh, elements to the stack, stack is going to have a shape like this. Now, for this, I'm going to stop sharing because I don't want you to see me drawing it. I want to draw it and then show you what happens. Just a second. So quickly, I'm going to draw this and then we're going to see what happens. So <coughs> My apologies. So this is what a stack looks like. This is what a stack looks like. Okay, 
so when you add so now this stack has three elements three notes each one of these guys are called a note so so each one of these over here this is what we call a node okay so a node essentially is an element of the stack so what happens is that if I want to add another node to this one this is what's going to happen so <clears throat> let's say in here I have um, two in here I have three in here I have four now I want to push the fifth the, the number five inside this stack so what happens is this first a node is created to be able to hold the five the number five that's my node number five is put in it then they make that node point to the top one after that is done they sever this top and they make the stop point to here now therefore the stack of mine and this entity over here this thing over here is my stack so this class over here is my stack okay so stack right now as you see it only has access to element five the the node that has, that has element five in it it is impossible for stack to have access to four unless it goes through five do we understand this and all right so the action of putting the five in there was called push the access access the action of taking the data out is called pop so when a stack pops the a value out because the top value is five first of all the value five is returned out so it extracts the value five and gives it back to any program that wants to get it so five comes out after five is gone it makes the pointer point back to the one that five is pointing to and removes the five therefore now four is in hand so essentially it goes back to this situation now if it wants to actually if it wants to actually pop four what happens is this it first extracts the value of four out and and keeps it somewhere to send it out then it says what is four pointing to top is going to point to so it's going to point to the next one and wipe this one out and now top is three if somebody pops another value out now three will come out and three will come out and after three comes out what three is pointing to top will point to that one and then <clears throat> this is removed from memory and then when the last one is popped out two two retur is returned out and top will point to where the next one is and because the next one is null now top is going to be null and this is gone therefore our stack is empty so that's the action of pushing and popping are we okay with are we okay with this <clears throat> all right so that's the action of pushing and popping so how can I actually implement that first of all because <clears throat> my stack over here requires a node to exist otherwise it cannot keep its data that's why what I'm gonna do firstly over here is to create a class called node and I'm putting it as an amp template over here so the node class of mine is going to hold some kind of a type in it integer double whatever the stack is of type it's gonna say and it's gonna say it has two uh, 
values in it. This static size over here is uh, another story that we're going to deal with it later. So I'm going to put the static note uh, size at the bottom, not to uh, make us confused at the moment. So this is essentially what our class node is holding. So it says you must be able to point to another node that's next you must be able to hold the type of data so essentially my node right now over here my node it has a pointer over here that is called m next and it has a data that is called m data this next is a pointer of type node so it can point to other, another node if needed or it can point to null if there is nothing after and uh, we have a constructor that gets a value of data and puts the value of data inside the the node so it essentially sets the data and sets the pointer to point to whatever it wants to point very simple and straightforward now um, obviously uh, the, this because the note that I have is passing data by value data is supposed to be able to uh, uh, handle rule of five so we, it has because it's passed by value it needs to do that and also um, if you notice something strange about the class node is that class node is fully private it means it does not have any it does not have any public members everything is private even the constructor and the destructor too well the constructor as you see it's adding one to num and removing one from num and that's a static uh, size num over here which is going to keep track of how many elements the node has so I don't have to count later on uh, as soon as the node gets created I can actually see how many nodes it has we can just remove it it's just a, a silly thing that I did over there so um, it, it is not actually a, a correct thing to do uh, because uh, I'll explain later this has a bug this size this size was an example just to show if I want to create an instance of this thing it can count how many nodes I have but later we'll see it's not a proper thing to do anyways uh, to be able to use that uh, num I have to instantiate it and initialize it outside that's why I have size t node t which is the num so that's my node um, now why this class node over here is private because stack is a composition it owns the node and without a class node doesn't mean anything we now without uh, without a stack node doesn't mean anything without node stack doesn't mean anything this is composition a stack is made up of is nodes because of that the node over here is fully private nobody no other class other than stack is allowed to even instantiate a class uh, uh, instantiate the class node and call its constructor so how do we enforce that we make the class stack a friend of node and we forward declare the class stack over here obviously because this is just a friendship over here but we know from op244 recall i said friend there is no such thing as friendship in c++ friends are always owners they are not actually friends therefore this node class of mine is completely at the mercy of stack stack can instantiate it stack can remove it stack is its only friend and that's it has access to all its properties and everything are we okay down to this point Now, stack is very actually simple to, to implement. Okay, uh, Lumia? Oh, misclicked. Okay, all right, no problem. Okay, so, <clears throat> so now 
now take a look. Let's take a look and see uh, how we actually implement this stack. So we say stack, the only thing stack has is a pointer called top. We mentioned that, you remember that. So when we create a stack, we said stack is nothing but a pointer that can point to a node. And if it doesn't point to anything, my stack is empty. And that's why it's actually pointing to null PTR. Obviously, um, another proper way of doing that was to write over here something like this. Use the app. Excuse me. is to do this to set it to null. It's the same thing. So setting to null. All right. Now, when I create a stack, I, my, my stack doesn't even need a constructor because when I create a stack, a stack is empty. And that's all it is. And making it null actually make an empty stack. Therefore, the default constructor that is created automatically by the system suffices and I do not need a default constructor for it. A stack in a safe empty state is a stack whose top is pointing to nowhere, which means it's empty. Are we okay with this? All right, now walk through with me with the stack over here to actually being pushing something and look at the function. It's a very simple function over here that says push some data into the stack. So I'm going to walk through it, do it step by step and see what happens. So let's say our stack is empty. It's just created. So that's my stack and the stack is pointing to nowhere. Now the function push is called. Now that the function push is called in here, it creates a new node of type T with the data on top. And we know that the constructor of node sets the data on top to whatever data on top to whatever they are. So if you just recall what the constructor of node did, the constructor of node sets the next pointer to whatever value that is coming in here and sets the data to whatever value that is coming there. So going back over here, let's walk through this one and see what happens. So now, first a new node is created. Okay, this is a new node. A new node is created. And after a new node is created, uh, it passes the data that is passed to push into the node. So data will get its value, whatever it is. And then it says, set the next of the node to whatever top is. Top currently is null, so this will be set to null. And right after doing that, new puts the address of this object into the top pointer. Therefore, the top pointer will no longer will be null and it's going to point to this element. Are we okay with the first push? Lovia is a mis misclick. <laughs> Go ahead. Line 30? Oh, okay. Okay, let me just do, let me just bring them both in so we can see what we are talking about. And you know what, everyone? Um, just a second. Let me remove this static thingy over here. That's nothing but confusion. So I'm going to remove that static thingy in here and this num I'll remove, this one I'll remove. I can always add it later on. There is no problem with that. Bad example. Um, I'm going to bring this up. There you go. And in here we have a depth. And I'm going to fix that depth. I'm not going to print the num. I'm going to fix that. Int depth. Uh, size, I'm going to make it uh, zero. Okay, now going back to 
to explaining what I wanted to do. So in push in here, I'm going to say size plus plus. In pop, I'm going to say size minus minus. That's that. And this one is going to return size. OK. Now going back over here, let's let's explain uh, uh, what's going on in here. I would love to be able to remove that thing. All right, that's much better. So now we see the now we see the push function over here, and also we see the constructor of node. Now, uh, Lomia, let's talk. Okay. So in here. When I'm saying stack, when I'm saying push, I'm passing a data, correct? Then I am saying create a new node. So the constructor of node with data on top are called. Are we okay with this? Okay. So it creates a temporary nameless dynamic node passing the data to the passing the data to the node so the data goes to the node okay and whatever is inside top goes to next which is this one and we had if you recall over here we had null over there you see this next yes the next becomes the top and top is null Got it? All right. So that's what happened. Um, easy breezy. So we'll, go, we'll do it. We'll go back. So essentially, whatever is in top goes to next. Are we clear on that? All right. Okay. So now to clarify this, we just, and size becomes plus plus, one will be added to it that we know, and it, it doesn't matter. So now the next thing I want to do over here is actually. The next thing I want to do over here is actually uh, doing another push. So let's say another value is actually being pushed in here. So another value is being pushed into the into the object. So, so line number 24 is being called. Therefore, a node is created. And the data is being pushed into it. So data goes into it. And the next will be what is top. Top is now pointing. Top is now pointing to this guy over here, to to the uh, last one that was entered. So the next of this node will point to the one that top is pointing. And then after that is done, it says whatever the address of this new uh, object is, put it in top. Therefore now. This will be gone, and top will point to here. I just pushed another thing into the stack. Do we understand this? Good. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we kind of play trick over here. So, but every time we push the value that is pushed stands at the top of the stack <clears throat> and the rest of these stuff become completely inaccessible so all these will be completely gone so these are all gone we don't have them anymore so as you see now the stack looks like something like this now the stack is actually has two elements now, so that's how push works. So how do we pop it? How do we, how do we take the values out? This is what happens. So pop first has a local value over here called val. It says val will be set to tops m data. Now we know that this is m data because this is m data. <coughs> because this is m data value over here. Oh, oh not that. back to the color I had so the value over here this variable value 
we'll get the, the data I have inside the, uh, the node. Then it says create a temporary pointer. I call it to delete. So this is to delete. And make it point to where top is pointing. So to delete, to delete keeps track of what is going to be deleted. Then it says tops next. If you look at it, this is top. So this becomes tops next. You see that? It says tops next should go into top. Therefore, where tops next is pointing, this is going to actually point to that one. And now after this is done, to delete will be deleted. And because of that, all these stuff will be gone. So this is going to be all gone. And what remains will be essentially the one. So I pop one out of it. And that returns a value. So it's as easy as that. This structure is called a stack. You can actually push stuff into it and pull stuff out of it. And that's as easy as it can get. Are we okay with this? Melissa. You don't get it at all? Top is only a pointer. Remember that. Top is only a pointer. Top is only a pointer. You can point anywhere it wants the same as the next of the node. So top and next of the node, they are of the same type. Top, as you see over here, is essentially, let me come back up over here. So top, let me, let me just wipe out this, the screen so we can see what we have. So top is a node pointer, correct? Next of node is a node pointer, correct? You know what next of node pointer looks like? I always do this in class and probably when we are coming for the lab, I'm going to actually make this. I actually make students to point, as, point at each other. Um, the next of a node is as if one student is pointing to another student. And at the end of its finger over there, pointing to someone, another student sitting. And that student is sit pointing to another student, and, it's, and a student pointing to another. And like that, as students are keeping track of who's next. The first student that is sitting over there is sitting in uh, some kind of a chair. So if that chair is empty, it means no students are there. But if the chair is not empty, then we have to see where the student points to, so we can go to next and follow whatever we have, okay? So this type of linked list, which each element points to the next one, always carry the same type of, oh, not that one, always carries the same type of uh, pointer of its node. So we are saying each node can point to the next node. And who keeps track of the one who's at the beginning of the queue, of the beginning of the lineup, or top of the lineup? That is the stack. So stack is only responsible to know who's at the top. And the rest are just responsible to, to say who's next, who's next, who's next, who's next. So with a stack, the... Uh, when a stack actually wants to, you, you, if, uh, the, to actually be able to go to the next element of a stack, you have to keep asking who's next, who's next, who's next, and keep going to the end of the stack. That's how it works. So that's the pointers of the node and the pointer of the stack. But how push and pop works is simply using the information that it has, which means it says, if I want to take a node out of the stack. First, I'm going to look and see if there is somebody at the top. If there is somebody at the top, I'm going to ask them, who's next? And that person is going to say, the guy sitting in the third row is the next. Therefore, I can remove this one from the stack and now point at the other guy. And I keep doing that until nobody's left. So that becomes the pop. 
okay? So push and pop in stacks work like this. I hope I made some kind of a sense, Melissa, or I don't make any sense. But may I ask, may I ask for a favor, Melissa? After the class is over, okay, uh, take this code that I have written over here and keep pressing F10 on it, okay? Keep pressing F10 on it and just walk through it, okay? And, but I want you to, I want you to, when you're, I want, oh, what happened? I want when you are walking through it, what, I, what I'm asking you to do is to make sure this walkthrough uh, is done with a pen and a paper, which means at any moment you see a new, you actually draw something and you keep going like that. You do it like that, it becomes crystal clear. And then we'll talk after. So now, <clears throat> let me just walk through it right, right now myself and see how it's going to look like. I lost my mouse. Where's my mouse? There you go. Found it. All right. So take, oh, oh, I don't have a main in here. That's interesting. I, th I thought I did have a main. Oh, yes, that main. Okay. So let me set this one as a starting pointer. So I'm, as a starting thing, I'm going to say over here, startup. Uh, set a startup. And why is it giving me an error? Did I change something over there? I ruined something. So, main. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, let me compile it and see. Control F7. good thank you so uh, let's start okay so as you see now I have two two stacks over here a stack of double and a stack of string so in here because each push returns a reference of the current object I simply push one by one so I'm gonna say D dot push 1.2 so 1.2 is pushed, it comes in here, it cr passes the data, and where top is that is null, because it's the first one that is pushing, and puts that address in top. And therefore now, top will point to the one that has 1.2 in it, and next is null. And it adds one to the size, and returns this. When it returns this, comes back to the next push with 2.3. 2.3 will be pushed, so as you see the data is 2.3, and top is now pointing to the one that has 1.2 and the next of it is null. But now the top is going to change because the new node is created, and now when you look at it, top is pointing to 2.3, and next is pointing to 1.2, and the next of that one is null. And I'm going to do the next, uh, and I'm going to enter the, the other one. So now 3.5 is pushed. I'm going to go quickly over that. And 4.5, 4, 4.6 is pushed. Now take a look at the top. Top is pointing to the one that has 4.9999, 4.6. Next of that one is the one with 3.5. Next of that one is the one with 2.3. Next of that one is the one with 2.2. Next of that one is null. It's unre un unable to read. Therefore, the stack is filled with all the information. Are we okay with this? All right. So now that we have done this, let's see how uh, the other one's going to work. So now all these things are pushed. We're going to do the exact same thing with this one. So I'm going to jump. I'm going to go right through it. So this is now inserting green. Then, uh, sorry, pushing blue. And now pushing black. Now if I look at S over here, top 
is pointing to black next of that one is blue next of that one is green next of that one unable to read because it's inaccessible okay so now I have that one now if I actually print the depth because the size of each is set properly it's gonna actually tell me that uh, the depth of the reason they call it depth is that you have actually no no access to the others you just need to know how deep it is so four doubles in a stack D and if we look at that one we have three strings in a stack S Whoa. are we okay down to this point <clears throat> Now I'm saying while D is not empty, the pool uh, uh, operator over here. Okay, I'm lucky. I thought I press uh, refresh, but I just made something full screen. Let me just, okay, that's better. Lucky I didn't press F5. Anyways, so now it's going to go in the Boolean. It's going to say, is the top not equal to null? yes so the object is not empty therefore it's going to come in it's going to pop the top one so what it's going to do <clears throat> it's going to have a value that is a double obviously and it's going to say that value is tops data and tops data we know it is 4.6 so val becomes 4.6 then it's going to say the one that is going to get deleted is top so it's going to keep track of what it's going to delete then it's going to say now top should point to tops next what is tops next tops next is 3.5 so it's going to set it to that one <clears throat> and now if we look at top top is pointing to 3.5 and to delete is keeping track of 2.4.6 that is supposed to get deleted which will be get deleted over here and the size is reduced by one <clears throat> and the value is returned to be printed so we can see the value 4.6 is printed and one by one it's going to pop the values out and we'll see that everything is printed back in reverse order the one that goes in last comes out first the exact same thing happens with the strings one by one until there is nothing left and if we actually look at it we'll see they are exactly popping back in the reverse order are we okay with this So this stack that you just saw, and I want you to actually go and walk through it, is a good practice for you to see how templates work. It's a template for a stack. <clears throat> and secondly, uh, it's a good practice for your programming to see exact, to see how a small little code that is written, because this is what, not even 50 lines of code, creates such a complicated dynamic uh, stack of nodes remember you can push limitless as long as your computer has memory you can keep adding to this and then you can remove it later on stacks are what we call it a type of link list so because each node is linking to the next node they call it a link list what type of a link list it is it is a stack are we okay with this and this ladies and gentlemen Yes, go ahead. Line seven. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you do T pointer, that's a beautiful question okay so oh, oh sorry bad color so this is a node right correct 
when you say T over here, T is this one. Correct? The type of data. Right? When you say node T, this is the one. Now, my question is, which one the pointer is supposed to point to? The data inside or the whole node? Therefore, you need the whole thing. Follow, you follow? If you only want it to point inside the, the... So you don't want to point, you want, because you want to be able to access the pointer too. Yeah, exactly, and that's what we call a node. Okay, all right. So that's that. Now, there are many, many other linked lists and stuff. Uh, later on, when we are coming to collections, I'm going to actually create more linked lists for you so you can actually see how those stuff are created. But please, please walk through this. This is a practice that I need you. I need you to do because I know y this will solve problems with templates if you walk through it properly, if it will solve problems with pointers, it will understand dynamic memory allocation, how all these uh, amazing data structures work, okay? But remember, the point we want to make over here, the stack is made up of nodes. A stack without a node doesn't have a meaning. Therefore, stack over here is a composition. Are we okay with this? If I can do a poll. <sighs> All right. Stack is composed of nodes. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Node is one of the members of the stack. Well, I don't know member, but like, yeah, I don't know. That's part. Uh, stack is made up of nodes. I don't. I don't know what what I can call it. It's uh, what stack is made up of. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, so that's that. Now the next thing we need to understand is what we call. Look at the example that they gave to so you can see, okay? Now, we have aggregation and we have association, okay? So, when you have an aggregation over here, uh, it says name over here. I would have used a person over here. A club and a person. A person can exist without being a member of a club. You can have a club that doesn't have any members, but it's still a club. So that's type of an aggregation that we have. So um, club doesn't take over creation of a member. And because of that, this is some kind of an aggregation. This is called what we call an aggregation. An association is some is a two-sided aggregation. Uh, first of all, do we understand what, what, what uh, aggregation is? Hopefully. Joy. Okay, Miss Clay. Uh, Siang Hong, how about you? Siang? Yeah, go ahead. Aggregation can be a hazard too. That's the thing. Uh, a club has members, right? Yeah, it, it is. They're both, forget about those English things that they put. Each one try to, they try to explain something. But in English, you're going to say, a person has a name, a car has a tire, a member. So has it can be 
many things, right? You know what I mean? So, so let's just understand this fact that with the composition, composition need its parts to exist. Where an aggregation doesn't need its parts. They, they both can exist without each other. But relationship is one too many. You have one club. It's, this is a bad example, actually, this club thing. Yeah, I hate that. Because the club can, can act, is actually an association. A person could be a member of five different clubs, correct? But this is not a good example. But again, if we would, if we would say, like, like, for example, being a member of a party. I cannot be the member of a conservative party and the liberal party, correct? It, it doesn't make sense. So a party and a member of a party is the best thing that we can call it aggregation. I can have the, the liberal party with no members. It's still, it's, it, is a, it is the liberal party. We understand what are the, uh, their uh, uh, basic uh, beliefs and stuff like that, even if it doesn't have a member. But a person who is liberal cannot be a liberal and a conservative. It cannot be both the same thing because... They don't, I don't know, they, uh, that's the meaning of it. So uh, a, a, a political party, in my opinion, is a better example for aggregation, is where a political party has members um, and it can exist without members uh, and it's a one-to-many relationship. So um, that's it, okay? So do we understand what aggregation is? And it's a one-to-many relationship. Now, association, what is association over here? Association is where it's an aggregation that is many-to-many -many relationship. I can have a subject and I can have a room. Uh, a subject can be taught in many different rooms, many diff uh, and uh, a room can hold many different subjects. So it's many-to-many -many relationship, and they're, they have nothing to do with each other with respect to creation. Nobody owns anything. Nobody has any uh, claim over the other person, and that's association. Do we understand that? So I wanted to actually write a code for this. I did write a code for this, and the, the code was uh, uh, pretty crazy. So what I'm going to do over here... Um, Because this was done with 2019, it's actually telling me it's, it's a 2019. I'm going to remove this. Let me. Uh, I'm going to remove this solution from here. Remove, 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 and open it separately so it gets converted. So let me go to today's stuff. So October seven. So that's the composition. I'm going to open it with a separate instance of Visual Studio so it gets converted to Visual Studio 2022. I want to make sure everything's good and fine and dandy. Okay. And the next one that I made for aggregation and association, it's actually, again, uh, I'm going to quickly explain it to you. I'm not going to bore you with it that much because it's uh, kind of a, um, looks like a very neat thing. I'm going to show it to you in a second. But uh, the fact that I actually created a manipulator in there. So I coded the manipulator to uh, to be able to have, to, to show the, uh, the, the association over there. Uh, between uh, both things, that's uh, a little tricky. So uh, let me just uh, close this one now that it's done and open the other one. That is the example for association and aggregation. So think of libraries and books. 
when you think about it, library and books are a perfect example of association. You have a book you have, that can appear in many different libraries, and you have a library that has many different books in it. So therefore, we call this many-to-many uh, -many relationship and a perfect example of aggregation. Um, or, uh, do, do we agree with that? Are we okay with this? Now, what we are going to do is, we are going to actually, here we go, bringing it up, there you go. So, I'm going to go directly to main, okay? So we can see actually what we are dealing with over here. So I have a library, Vaughan, Toronto, and Yorkdale. I have books. These are the books that I have. And I'm going to create an array of libraries. I'm creating an uh, array of pointers of libraries, an array of pointers of books. Then I'm going to show the library and the books. Then I'm going to put these books inside the library and put these books inside the second library and put these books inside the third library and then show each library and we'll see what happens. So uh, I'm going to walk through it with, with uh, F10 because I, I don't want to go to it, uh, but um, I want you to write, I want you to take a look at the code later on. Um, I'm, I'm going to do a quick walkthrough um, to show you how it works. Um, I actually, I think I created actually a class diagram for it too. Um, that would be nice to be to, to look at. Okay, so so when we uh, when we look at the the uh, code for a book and a library, a book is essentially a book is essentially oh sorry that's book cpp I need a book dot h. So as you see, a book has an array of pointers for, a library has an array of pointers of books, and a book has an array of pointers of libraries. So each book can contain many libraries. So if I actually run the program now, you will see that the, the libraries are created. So if I look at it, this is the Vaughn library, okay, it's Vaughn. The other one is Toronto and Yorkdale. And I have series of books created, and each of them has its own title. And like this is Green Eggs and Ham, for example. Now I create the library, and the library show the library list, and that's what's going to show all the libraries. Then in here, I'm going to show the books, and that's going to show all the books. Now what I'm going to do in here, I'm going to put <coughs> a Fox and Socks, uh, crime and Punishment, and C reference into Vaughn Library. Then I'm going to put Green Eggs and Ham, uh, C reference, and C++ programming into the Toronto Library. And I'm going to put Green Eggs and Ham, the C language and C++ reference, uh, sorry, uh, the uh, Fox and Sox, Green Eggs and Ham, Harry Potter, and the uh, uh, Crime and Punishment in the Yorkdale Library. And now when I show the libraries, it's going to actually tell us that we have libraries and books available in those libraries are these values, as you see. And now if I actually show the books, if I actually show the books, show the books, what happened? There you go. If I show the books, you will see that the C reference library is available in Toronto and Vaughan and so on and so forth. So it's a perfect example of uh, 
perfect example of uh, association between the two objects. Uh, are we okay with this? Okay, so um, how it's designed actually, how I actually designed this thing. Uh, if we look at the class diagram, this is what it is. And I want you to, before I actually go through this, I want you to actually look at it um, uh, at home. Try to walk through it, see if you can understand it. Uh, so these are the classes that we have. So I have the... Some reason my computer is extremely slow. I don't know why. Holy schmoly. Yeah. And this hides subcontent. That's a manipulator that I created. It. So re uh, remember when you are doing C out, you write left and everything becomes left justified. You put set with. So the manipulators that you use with C in and C out, this is the same thing but is for the library and books. So I can print a book and I put hot, uh, hide subcontent. It's not going to show its subcontent and it's just going to show the books. So you will see it. Anyway, so this is the, uh, the, uh, the class diagram. They're all of type IOML. And uh, yeah, so um, going through them, well, what I want you to do, please, uh, at home, uh, try to walk through it. Just press F then and go through it and walk through it and see if you can understand how it works. And the next day you are coming in the lab, I'm going to actually walk through it in detail and show you, um, um, answer all your questions. But I want you to first look at the code. It's not much, as you see, like book is like five lines of code, but it, uh, uh, not five lines, it's like 80 lines of code, but when you actually um, walk through it, it's um, it's that uh, professional way of writing C++. So take a look at it, try and see if uh, uh, you can understand how it works, and the next day you come in, you come with questions, and I'm going to explain um, the details of its working. Are we okay down to this point? So what I'm going to do now is, uh, first I'm going to commit these two things to the repo. Let me close this one. And then we're going to talk about functions. Association, I'm just going to commit it. Commit and push. There you go. So it's up. And now let's continue with the rest of the stuff. So the next thing I want to talk about is. Yeah, function syntaxes. It's actually important stuff. When you 
are actually right um, let's uh, <coughs> write the good old things that we have so I'm gonna write int add int a and int b okay you you used to write your functions like this and then you say return a plus b okay <coughs> then uh, and you write your main as int main and return zero. And in here, you write the function and you run it. So you, you call the function and you run it. So integer, I don't know, x is 10. And then we have integer y, 20. And integer z, 30. I'm going to say, uh, actually, just a set. Now I'm going to say z is set to add of x and y. So this is how we wrote our function, and we are very happy. Life was beautiful, but no problem. Okay? <clears throat> but the new syntax of functions in C++ is asking you to create your functions in another way, which means instead of telling what your function returns, let that thing be decided by uh, the auto variable. So instead of saying the auto, fun, uh, auto statement, so instead of saying uh, my function add uh, returns an integer and it receives two arguments a and b, you will say auto add that returns an int. So that becomes the new syntax of functions in C++. <coughs> so your int main is not int main anymore. It's auto main that returns int. The outcome is the same. It works the exact same way. The only thing you need to do is to put the uh, integer, uh, whatever return value is, at the back. So. Uh, the auto at the beginning, what is returned at the back. Auto at the beginning, what is returned at the back. And that's all the functions that you are to, that you have to write. Uh, are we okay with this? I don't know if you're okay with this, but do we understand um, what, what I just said? Uh, do we understand how we are supposed to do it now? Joy. Misclick, or you didn't understand? Why? No, 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 that's not the reason. That's not the reason. <laughs> that's not the reason. Um, um, let me give you an example of of why we need actually this type of declaration. <coughs> so let's uh, let's name this one function syntax, new function syntax. So I'm going to call it a uh, new function syntax. <coughs> the reason is that sometimes a function call cannot decide what the output is before you know what it's supposed to do. I'm not making sense at all. I'm going to change this to a, this little thing that we have written into a template and then we'll see what I'm about to talk about, what, what I'm about to say. So let's say this add of mine that I have written, <coughs> let's say this add of mine, I'm writing it the old, uh, the, uh, like I did it the, uh, like the old time. So I'm going to write this. <clears throat> I'm going to write over here int add, and I'm going to re return int over here. Um, Joy, you're with me, right? Yeah, I, I want you to have your microphone on so I don't go too far. I want to 
uh, make sure that I can make a point, okay? So let's say the add method that I have over here, I want to pass two different types of things, like add between a double and an int. Got it? So the template that I want to create is something like that. Template, say, um, type name, and I'm going to put over here A, and type name, so I'll call it, I'll call it AT, and I'm going to call another type name, that's B type. Type name, B type, okay, so BT. So I have two types. I have AT and BT, and in here I'm going to say first one is A type, and the second one is B type. Are you okay with this? Now the question is, what is the return type? Should I use B type or A type? Can you say? Yeah, exactly. There's no way to decide that. That's why we have this magical thing called declared type. So essentially what happens, you, you, we actually have, we have something like this. So I can actually say declare type, um, declare, declare type, let's say, um, I'm going to say over here int A and double B, okay? I can say declare type A plus B, and in here I can actually write C. That's something that we have in C language, in C++ language. So in here, when I have 10, and in here, when I have 30, Joey, what is the type of A plus B? What's going to be the outcome? It has to be double, right? Whenever you have two, like we know that when an integer and double are added up, the result is double. It's always the bigger one, right? So if I have, it, this is for primitive types, but sometimes you have an employee and a string. When you add these things together, it creates an employee because it's if you're adding last name to employee. Or you know what I mean? Like it, you cannot, so this declare type checks this and sees what the outcome of the type will be. In this case, it's going to be double. And therefore, C becomes a double. So when you say C is equal to A plus B, no surprises. You're not going to lose any values. Do we understand what declare type does? Okay, so declare type before the addition is done, it checks to see what is the outcome. And this will take that type. Does everybody understand this? It examines the, the procedure and sees what the output's going to be. Now, because we have the new syntax, what I can do in here is to actually do this. I can say template yada, yada, yada. Now in here I can say auto. And now I can actually see what the values are before I actually do it by saying declare type A and B. I could not do that before I do not I could not do that before because I couldn't put any type in here decide what to put, right? But when I actually put the declared type over here, it automatically takes the type that is proper between these two and creates the proper template for me. Uh, do we understand this, hopefully? Without the new syntax, this type of template would have been impossible. Do we understand this? And therefore, from now on, just for practice, any function we're writing, please write it with this syntax, not with the old one. So anything you write, write auto add this and that, auto add, and then put the return type at the end. And that's what's the need of it. So in here, I can actually, so now I can actually say over here, uh, double C, and I can say C, 
is equal to add of a and b and that will work perfectly absolute with absolutely no problem so now i can actually print c over here and um, because when add is created i have an integer and a double uh, the type that is going to return will be double and therefore everything is going to work properly so let's bring it up and that's that one questions down to this point are we okay are we okay everyone all right so yes that's that one so we called it i'm gonna call what do i call this i'm gonna say uh why do syntax that's why all right um, What happens so forget about this one let's uh, write something like this so I'm gonna write something like void print character no let me let me explain something else I have 10 minutes and let me uh, see if I can actually um, uh, pull this thing in and to try to make some sense out of it because it's a very complicated mathematical con not a very very simple mathematical concept which created something amazing in uh, computer science give me a second so There is uh, uh, a, a technique of to prove something in mathematics to prove if certain uh, function works in a proper way. It's called mathematical induction. What does mathematical induction say? Let's say I have a function, talking C, let's say I have a function that works on series of things uh, in, in, a, in an array. Let's say I have a function that works on series of stuff uh, that receives those values and generates an output. So let's say I have I don't want to be technical. I want to make it as English as possible. I don't want to talk any mathematics, okay? I just want to sh tell you something and see if we can actually make sense out of it. If I have series of stuff that can be passed to a function, and let's put some number for you. So, uh, number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. So, thing number one thing number two thing number three and i can pass these things 
into a function. A function will receive this value, do some type of, type of processes, and return an um, outcome based on the first element that we have. And then we can pass the second element to these function and generates another output out of it. Let's assume that we have such a function that works on series of, of stuff and I want to see if this function works correctly on all the stuffs that exist in this range of values. Um, am I making sense? Uh, I just want you to assume that this function of mine that we are talking about over here can receive series, let's say, of numbers that are all within uh, uh, a sequential term. And when I give the first one to the function, uh, it, it produces some result. Uh, and from and because it's sequential, having the first value allows me to, to access the second one. So because it's sequential, if I have the first one, I can get to the second one. Then I can get to the third one, like integer numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's a sequential series of numbers, and I want to pass those values to a, to a function and see if those values are presented properly and they work properly or not. This is my quest, to see if some function works properly on series of values that are passed to it. Do you understand what is my goal? Okay, so, my question is, if this function, we are 100% sure that this function works if we are 100% sure that this function works perfectly for the first value. So value number one works perfectly for the first function. So my function, whatever it is, my function is okay. My function is okay for for the for, for first value. Let's assume that's a fact and I know it. Now, if somehow I can prove, if somehow I can make sure that given any element of this series of arrays, if I can prove that if third one is correct, then the fourth one is correct too. So get some kind of an assurance if I can prove somehow that assuming that array number X is correct and from that one value X plus one is correct too, which means if I can prove that if I pass element number three to function, number four is correct too. If I do that, then obviously the function works for everything because I just proved for this element, if it's correct for first element, it's correct for next. Because it's correct for one, it's going to be correct for two. Because it's correct for two, it's going to be correct for three. Because it's correct for three, it's going to be correct for four. Therefore, it corrects. it is correct for everything. So, if a function works for the first value properly and out of the nth value I can get nth plus one value working properly too, then function is working perfectly for all of them. Do we understand this? Or I just lost all of you? And if I lose you, then we have to do this in class. Do we understand this? Oh, you do? Good, 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 good. So, now let's write some code. Let's say I want to write the code for uh, finding the factorial of a number. Now, you know what the factorial of a number is. Factorial of a number says uh, 
if you want to know what is factorial of number let's say four that means one multiplied by two multiplied by three multiplied by four so that's what the factorial of four is if i want to know what is factorial of ten it's one multiplied by two multiplied by three multiplied by four multi and it goes up to ten that is called uh, factorial of a number in mathematics uh, do we understand this so what i want to write is a function that creates this factorial for me so what i will do over here let's create uh let's say uh unsign unsigned let's call that factorial and i'm going to say unsigned x okay now my question is that and please answer this question if the number that i'm passing to factorial is one if i pass the number to factorial that is one what is going to be the answer for it so factorial number one what is the answer what should it return what is the factorial of one Of course, one. Everybody's correct. It's one. So perfect. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say if x was one, I'm going to return one. Ta-da! So now I, I am sure that my factorial works perfectly for the first value that I can add to the function are we okay with this oops sorry are we okay with this all right now my question is that <clears throat> isn't this true that factorial of the number four for example factorial of number four is essentially one multiplied by two multiplied by three multiplied by four that's that's perfectly correct right can somebody tell me what is this you can activate your microphone isn't one multiplied by two multiplied by three factorial factorial of three correct everybody's okay with that right that is actually factorial of three right all right if that's the case so from factorial three i can easily what ca calculate what factorial four is so factorial uh, th factorial four is factorial three multiply by four do we understand this and the factorial of 10 is factorial of nine multiplied by 10 is that correct perfect so if that's the case i can simply write over here else if x is not one then return x multiplied by factorial of x minus one You see that do we understand that now this function doesn't have any loop it doesn't have anything it simply calls itself but how can it call itself the answer is that don't worry about it because of mathematical induction uh, technique to actually prove this thing because of we can prove that this is perfectly correct why because for the first element it works pro perfectly correct and for any element that you give to it it's going to give you exactly the value of the next one therefore because it's correct for one it's going to be correct for two it's going to be correct for three it's going to be correct for four and therefore if i say over here int main <coughs> return zero i can actually say c out factorial of four and 
what you see is going to be this. Ta-da, 24. And it calculates it perfectly. This is called recursion, when a function calls itself. So, in other words, in other words, why did I put C over here? This is B. In other words, when you create, so when you have a, a problem you want to solve, and a problem is actually built up of its own pieces, you can always use recursion. A good example for it is that if you want to draw a tree, how do you do that? If you look at a branch of a tree, it's essentially a smaller tree. And you can keep going inside it like that. So a tree is made up of smaller trees. So all you need to do, like if I told you uh, what a tree is, it's just a collection of smaller trees attached to each other. Anything like that can easily be solved by recursion. Now I can give you another example over here. I know the time has passed, but <clears throat> we started a little late, so bear with me. Uh, how many of you know the game uh, Towers of Hanoi? Oh, <laughs> one person knows it. Okay, so I'll explain to the rest of you. So this is how Towers of Hanoi's, Hanoi works. <clears throat> Towers of Hanoi is like that. There are a series of, there are three poles. So you put three poles, you have three poles sitting uh, on the ground. So one pole, two pole, and three poles. And on these poles you have series of rings. So the series of rings are on these poles like this, like that, and then smaller smaller and then smaller. So these poles are sorted from big to small rings around that pole. Do we understand this? So the game is this. The game says to, actually let me see if I have the, I think I have the Give me a second. I think I have the thing somewhere, the PowerPoint thingy somewhere. Let me just take a look. Give me two seconds. beautiful PowerPoint presentation out of it, which is not needed. Anyway, so, so the objective of the game is that the, the, the rules of the game is that you can only move one ring at a time. You cannot move more than one ring, only one ring at a time. And you are not allowed to put a smaller, a, a bigger ring over the smaller one. Therefore, and uh, using this rule, uh, so one ring at a time, and you are not allowed to put a, sm a bigger ring on a smaller one. Your objective is to move all the rings from one, from one pole to another. So essentially move everything from here to here and put them over here. So, uh, put, so essentially how it works is that when you have the, the first movement is going to be, you're going to move the, the smaller one. Oh, sorry. You're going to move the smaller one. You're going to move the smaller one over here. Then you're going to put the big one over here. Then you're going to move the smaller one over that one. Then you're going to put the big one over here. Then you put the smaller. And you keep moving it back like this until everything is moved from here 
to the last one. Do we understand the game? When you look at this game, Hanoi Towers is actually made up of a smaller Hanoi Tower when you look at this game. Take a look. If I actually, whoops, if I actually look at this, Hanoi Towers is one ring at the bottom. Whoa, that's too small. One ring at the bottom and a smaller Hanoi Tower sitting at the top. Do we understand this? So if that's the case, let's write a function that actually solves this, solves this, uh, uh, this game, actually does the game for us. And let's program something that actually uh, make this thing work. So how do we do it? So what I'm going to do, um, so how do we write it? How do we write it? I'm going to write it as, let's call it, so I'm going to call it void uh, Hanoi. And this Hanoi Towers of mine will have certain number of rings. So this is how many rings I have left. I have 10 rings sitting uh, uh, from the bottom to top, and I want to move them. I want to move them from uh, pole A uh, th using pole B, and I want to pass them to pole C. So I'm gonna. So that's gonna, so those are the characters. So essentially. When I'm calling my Hanoi Towers, I'm going to say Hanoi. In here, I'm going to say I have uh, four rings, and I want to move it from A through pole B and pass it to pole C. So this is how I want to write my function. Um, are we okay with? Are we okay with this? So, so um, sorry, um, again, I want to move an object from A to B using pole C. Let's do it like this, from A to B using pole C. So I want to move everything from the first one to the second one. That's what I want to do. That was the, the object. I want to move everything from A to B. So if I want to do that, If I only have, I'm doing the exact same thing I had over there. If I only have one ring, <clears throat> what the solution is going to be, right? What if, so I have one ring on pole A and I want to move it to pole, pole B. So what do I need to do? I need to move, see out, I need to move. Uh, move from A to B. So if I have only one, I want to move from A to B. Is this okay? Okay, but if I do not have only one, I have many. If I do not have one, I have many. What do I need to do? Just imagine. If I have, if I do not have one, so this is my, these are my three poles. Okay, so I have many over here. So this is the first one. Okay, and then I have these small ones over here at the top. Okay, so if I have more than one, what 
what I can do is essentially moving all these three, moving all these three from pool A to C. So if somebody could do that for me, I would move these three over here first. And then after moving that, I only have one. So I'm going to move that one to here. And then after everything is done, I'm going to move these three back over here and problem is solved. So essentially what I need to do is to call the Hanoi Towers to move everything to the last one, then move the single one over here and then move those three back over here. Um, do we understand this? Okay, so let's do that. So in here, I'm going to say, I'm going to call the Hanoi Towers for n minus 1, because I want to pick only the top ones. And I'm going to say, from the, the, uh, the pole A, put everything on pole C using pole B. So that's essentially my function is. So first, I move the top three to the other one. Now that I put the top three to the other one, I have to move that single one over there. So I'm going to say C out, move from PA to PB. So I'm moving from PA to BB, and that's moving the, the single one over there. Now that the single one is moved, I'm going to take everything from C and put it on B. So I'm going to say Hanoi. Take the n minus 1 that I put, that I have put on PC and put it on PB using PA. And done. My function is written. If I run this program now, now if you have coins at home, put four coins on each other, so make it like a uh, sorting it in a, in a descending order, so bring it up from the bottom to top, and try this. So when I actually run this program, you will see that it tells you move the first one from A to C, the other one A to B, C to B, A to C, and it goes through everything, and follow these things, you'll see that the problem is solved. Do we understand this? If you say, yes, you're lying, <laughs> you just you have to trust the math. So that's what's going on. Uh, it's very difficult to grasp it, but that's how it is. Because of mathematical induction, because you can prove that if one is correct, if the first for, for this Hanoi Tower function works for the first for only one ring. Now, if I assume that it works properly for the three things that are the three rings that are at the top, I can simply use that three things at the top and uh, uh, solve the problem with it. Therefore, from three, the fourth one is going to work perfectly, uh, and therefore uh, everything works perfectly. It's just uh, math, baby. That's all. Uh, clear math. Uh, and that's that. And I want you to actually put over here something like three and walk through it and you will see that it's going to work. And that's recursion for you. So how do we know the recursive thing? How, do, how does it work? It's with practice. It's very difficult to actually write recursive functions right for out of scratch. But with recursive functions, I had this friend that is used to tell me if you want to know, if you want to know how to, uh, uh, write recursive functions. When you start writing the functions, first you have to assume somebody already wrote it and then start writing it. So as you see, somebody already wrote the function that works for everything but the last one and then start writing it and then the recursion is going to work out. Um, they actually had a study and they they had a few kids in a, in a, in a um, in a high school and they did not teach any loops to them. They started everything with recursion. So 
they did everything they did with recursive functions. They have never uh, used any loop in their in their programming, and it worked perfectly. So everything that you can do can be converted to recursion. Every single compiler that you are using is a recursive algorithm because each statement of yours is made up of other statements. And because of that, every single compiler does the syntax checking using recursive algorithms. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, so, any questions? Problem. <laughs> Problem. <laughs> I have to check in. I don't know what's going on. Uh, I beg your pardon? One more time? Yeah, I mean, it's like a problem. Yeah, I know. Please walk through it. It looks like when I write over here, you just see I just had two print statements over here and two function calls. And I just solved the game. Just because I followed the rules of math, Go Google mathematical induction and see what what is that proving technique. If you learn that, if you be, if you be able to think recursively, then you can do it. Again, it's like playing chess. Yes, but it's very expensive. I'll tell you why. Every single time, because this function is calling itself, correct? And let me actually see, let's see how many times it's calling itself. So what I'm going to do in here, I'm going to actually create it. I'm going to call it over here uh, static integer row, okay? And I'm going to set it to 1. Okay, so it's a static integer. So it's not going to get recreated. Anytime this function is called, it's going to have its old value. And in here, every time I'm seeing C out, I'm doing C out, I'm going to say row <coughs> plus plus. And in here, I'm going to do it like that. So it actually shows the row number. And in here too. So I'm going to say row plus plus. And I'm going to do it like this. So if I run this program now, you will see that to, to solve this thing, this function called itself 15 times. Now, take a look at this. Get ready. I made that 40. Take a look. I think we have to wait, I don't know. So these are the number of times the function called itself. And you have no idea what is it doing to my memory. Because the function is not finished until the last one is called. Which means now I have 2,000 function calls in my memory. And it's holding every single variable in that function until the last function is done. Imagine the amount of memory it has to use to be able to do that. And it's still going. You see that? So it's, it's a very, ex like if, I, if you go Google Hanoi Towers non-recursive, okay? Or Towers of Hanoi uh, uh, non-recursive. And you see it can be written with a loop. Of course, it's much more complicated than this. So non-recursive algorithms are very complicated to do the same thing a recursive algorithm can do simply. But the difference is that non-recursive algorithms use much less computer's resources than recursive algorithms because the code is simple, humongous amount of information is happening underneath. And it's still going, people. Okay. All right. Okay. I know you played with it, and if if you knew programming, then you could easily do it. <laughs> so yeah. So and it's still going.
Yes, so, yeah, it's 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 humongous amount of move, yeah, and 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 it keeps going. And it's the, before I crash my computer, I'm gonna stop this program, okay? Because those many function calls are all in memory. So each one of those is keeping these things until everything is done, and it has to go back in. When everything is done, it kind of jumps. It's like recursive functions are like uh, you're winding a. Uh, 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 something and and it's supposed to make a ring so you keep going and going and going and you let go and the spring goes back and it doesn't do any ex do any execution until the screen uh, the, the the spring is winding back and that's that's pretty crazy so anyways walk through this with with like three or four uh, and you'll see what I mean okay all right, it's 7.30 and uh, uh, I'm, my wife uh, keeps calling me on my phone, probably is telling me, come home. I've got to go home. Uh, 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 when we come back, we're going to do some serious function stuff. The next day you are coming here, we're going to do awesome stuff with functions. So you thought that you, pointers holding address of variables are cool? I'm going to show you pointers that instead of variable, they point to a piece of code in memory that you can actually execute. That's the, what we're going to do next time. Uh, any questions? All right, ladies and gents, I'm going to put these things right now up. Please go play with them, walk through them, and see um, if, uh, if you can uh, uh, work with it. Wow. Two hours past. Have yourself a beautiful, beautiful day, and I will talk to you soon.